Next, we have Joe no Panic, Blazing the Migration Trail. Thank you. Mike and Kathy Stevens. Um, before I dive into this uh, presentation, I do want to issue a couple of warnings. This presentation will be discussing system migrations, and that topic may evoke some strong, possibly negative emotions and memories for those of you who have been through a migration before. <laughs> Also, this presentation takes the Blazing New Trails conference theme in a slightly intergalactic direction. And as a result, there may be slightly too many references to Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yay. So if you do not know that book or the 2005 movie, which has you know been flaws that we don't need to discuss here. Um, yeah. It's just, yeah. So what we will cover in this section, we are going to talk about why system migrations have a bad reputation, what you can do to have a more positive experience with migration. And I'll also be sharing with you a story of a very recent Symphony to Coha migration story. Why does this matter, you may be asking, because Presumably, all of you are already on Koha, and you have no intention of ever leaving Koha and never going through another migration experience again, right? Well, I have to, I have to bring it to you. Migrations are unavoidable. Even if you're on Koha right now, you may be facing at some point in the future a migration of your Koha system from one server to another server. You may also be looking at or thinking about migrating systems that are not your integrated library system. So migrating your library guides, or migrating your digital archive. So everything that I'm going to be talking about here is also applicable to upgrades, new staff trainings, other types of similar situations. Yeah. And also, why it matters, well, we're the Koha community, and we have this wonderful spirit of sharing wisdom. So. We've gone through a recent migration experience, and I'm here to share that wisdom. So, you may be asking yourself, okay, here's Micah. Who is Micah representing today? Uh, some of you may remember I was the library director at Lancaster Theological Seminary. Well, today I'm here representing two different organizations. The first is Fosdale. Uh, which is uh, my own company. It's a benefit LLC that was founded in January 2023. It's an executive coaching and consulting firm that specializes in integrated library planning, leadership development for librarians, and open initiatives in libraries. I'm also here representing the Ramapo Catskill Library System, which is a 47-member public library consortium they migrated to Aspen Discovery in 2022, hosted and supported by Bywater Solutions. And they are very recent, very recent, as of Monday, August 5th, recent member of the Koha community. So as a result, the folks from RCLS could not be here in person, but we do have several of them online in Zoom. And so they'll be joining as part of the Q&A part later. Yeah. So how do we typically react <laughs> to system migrations? <laughs> Have you ever thought about laying down in front of the bulldozer that is the system migration and saying, no, don't do this? Um, I once had a library director tell me very honestly and, and very strongly, I have gone through one ILS migration in my career, and I will never do another one. And it wasn't, you know, it, that feeling was not something that was foreign to me, strange to me. Um, you know, I was well aware of, you know, several people, uh, several colleagues at other libraries who had similar feelings. But when I was confronted, with this particular librarian and how she said it, the emotions that were behind it, um, it really impacted me that we're, we're not only doing a disservice 
to our libraries, but are a disservice to ourselves when we hold on to these emotions and and about system migrations. So what's underneath this? Let's let's unpack it a little bit. First, there's that fear. There's a fear that it's it's an unknown experience. So if you haven't gone through a migration before, it's something you you really aren't quite sure of what's going to happen. It's, it's this big, scary, unknown. There's also a lot of stress um, that's related to the complexity, the amount of work that's involved. I mean, let's face it, migrations are a lot of work. There's reluctance in there, reluctance to face things that have been ignored for a long time. How many of you have those cataloging backlogs? All those messy records, the shelves of material that's in the back room that you just haven't wanted to deal with? Well, migrations are, are the perfect opportunity to clean that up, but who wants to go into all of that dust and muck and messy data and clean that up? I mean, you've already been avoiding it for years. Why, why do you want to do it now? Sometimes, too, you're also facing these emotions of resentment that there's no choice. So some libraries um, are come into a migration because it's, it's something that is imposed on them. They don't have a choice. Um, you know, a few years ago, which library system was it? It was one of the, one of the Cersei systems, maybe. They were ending support. And so libraries were going to have to move to the new version of that system or move to another system because that company was just ending support, the product was going away, you were going to have to move. And, you know, nobody wants to be told you have to move or you have to migrate, you have to change. And so, you know, sometimes when you're being told that this is something you must do, you have no choice, that builds up some, some feelings of resentment. And what do all these feelings go into? It goes into behaviors of avoidance and even, in some cases, like Arthur did here, obstruction. We don't want to do it. We want to run away or we want to stop it at all costs. I'm going to tell you two truths. Migrations are change. We live in a world of change. Change is all around us. And yes, migrations are change. Migrations don't just change our systems, though. Migrations change human behavior. And the second truth of all of this is that change requires transition. In order for a change to be successful, you have to have transition. Transition is not just training. And so sometimes when we're looking at system migrations, we really get hung up on the actual system, the workflows, how are we going to train to, you know, how are we going to use the new system? It's all of that education piece. What, what we also have to pay attention to, because that's important. That is super important. You have to be able to know how to use these tools. But what's also important is paying attention to giving that space to process through all of the emotions that go with the migration and give that space for transition. So one way of um, understanding transition or um, is this Bridges transition model. So if any of you are familiar with the work of William Bridges, this is from uh, a book called Managing Transitions, Making the Most of Change. Basically what this is, is it's three concurrent processes that happen in this period of transition. And so if you, you imagine here, you've got um, along the horizontal axis here, that's your timeline. That's time progressing from the start of the change to the end of the change. And the vertical axis here is um, the amount of 
energy or attention that you're giving. So at the very start, you're giving a lot of your energy into the ending process. So that's ending, losing, letting go of what has been. Then you progress even further towards the middle, you see more of your energy is going into this neutral zone. Neutral zone is where the chaos is. It's where everything is really messy. It's where you're trying to straddle the old and the new. It's where a lot of creativity happens. It's where a lot of problem solving happens. And it's messy. We don't like it. Some of us, particularly introverted librarians who like things to be in order, don't like a lot of mess. Um, but you see how there's so much space here in that neutral zone. It's not something we can rush. We have to figure out a way to live in that messy space for a little bit. On the other side of that, as you get towards the end, you're in that new beginning, you're more of your energy is going into that new beginning stage. So that's where you're settling into that new reality, living with the new system. So another thing though to note though, is even right here at the start, you still got a little sliver of new beginnings and a little sliver of the neutral zone. And at the end, with as much of the new beginnings, you've still got a little sliver of neutral zone and a little sliver of letting go. So you have to attend to all three of these processes throughout your transition period. It's just your, the amount of energy that you devote to each of those is flexible and changes as you move through. Transition has multiple functions, as I've, as I've mentioned here. And so it's like a towel, right? We all have our towels, right? I have one in my bag, actually, that I carry with me all the time. Um, towels are, um, and transition is about the most massively useful thing anyone can have. So what this transition space and time can provide is it's where you share information again and again and again and again. It's where you identify what's being lost. It's where you specify what's ending and what's continuing. Because in, in migrations, you're not, everything isn't going away. There are some things that will continue. It's where you grieve, where you grieve that ending. And as much as you might hate your old library system, there's still going to be some things to grieve. It's where you create within chaos. It is also that space and that time where you do your repatterning and your retraining. It's where you can share purpose and you plan. It's a space where you define roles. And you also encourage participation. And finally, and most also very importantly, you celebrate your successes. Those kind of, that bookends kind of with the, with grieving the ending and celebrating your successes. It's really important to make space for both of those. So, I would like now to transition into the RCLS migration story. So, here we have the, the Bridges transition model, and I'm going to superimpose what RCLS did on top, of, on top of this transition model so you can see how it actually works in practice. So, for RCLS, in January to March, that was kind of the first phase of the migration. 
in this phase, they were communicating about migrations. We are going to do a migration. Here are the changes that are coming. This is the point in which the timeline is established uh, because they were, um, our CLS was going through migration with Bywater as they're hosting a support partner. Uh, a timeline is already pretty graciously provided. Our CLS takes that timeline and then adds to it and says, okay, what do our people need in addition to what Bywater is already providing for us? It was a time to begin to define roles. So this, um, one of the phases, that uh, part of the phase to transition was asking for people to volunteer to be first liners, to come in, to be the first ones to be trained, to be the first ones to learn about COMA, to help test the system before the training was then opened up to all library staff. So, you know, and then there's also you know, folks at RCLS headquarters, you know, who's going to be supporting the migration and what are the different roles of the people at headquarters involved in the migration process. So defining those roles is really important. During this period, there was also a strong um, movement toward assessing what was going to be lost from the old system, which was Circe Dynex Symphony. Uh, to COPA, what was, what was going to be lost in, in that migration, and identifying what else needed to change. You know, it's, it's, very, it's pretty clear you're going to have to change workflows. You're going to have to change, um, you know, certain things, how, you know, how things have been done. But what else needs to change? And then there was a really... Um, we did a lot in this period setting up the um, relationships and uh, communication pathways with administrative leadership so that the policies, library policies, and our CLX policies could be um, viewed and updated so um, to help make the migration a little bit smoother. So the second piece of this, which was definitely living more in that neutral zone chaotic space, was from April to July. And again, communication at the very top, communicating regularly about expectations, timeline, what's going on right now, how can you help, um, how can you uh, you know, continue to test. Um, what can you expect from the test system? What's working right now? What's not working right now? Um, and also, too, expectations for what's going to happen when we get to the other side of testing. Here, you know, here's how you can prepare for go live weekend. Here's, um, you know, how how many days that your library is going to be without a library system and being offline and do you want to be open or do you want to close your library for part of that period? All of that was part of the communications in this period. This is also when we began developing documentation for the new system and, um, and also testing the new system. We were training first liners it was two-stage training period, so training first liners and then training general staff. And of course, as part of that training, the system was also being tested. We encouraged, um, and this is something that I thought worked really, really well, we encouraged a lot of questions and we encouraged people to submit bug reports. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that the key takeaways. It was also a time when we were listening to feedback and responding to concerns with compassion and understanding. So, you know, getting emails about, hey, this doesn't work, or wait a minute, I could do this in Symphony, but I can't figure out how to do this in COA. Um, one of the approaches that I took when answering those types of emails would be saying, Thank you so much for, for raising this question. I'm sorry to hear that you're having trouble. Let's see what we can do 
to to make this as as much like what you're used to as possible. Um, so that, you know, instead of just jumping straight into problem solving, which I think some of us as librarians, we're used to answering questions, we're used to finding the answers. Sometimes people just want to be heard and they want to make sure that you know that you've heard them and you've seen them and you see what they're going through. So taking a moment to do that can really help. And so finally, here we are in August, we're at, um, in the third phase of this migration rollout, communicating frequently and clearly up to that go live uh, experience. So um, there were lots of emails that went out even on the day when um, systems were due to go offline, emails, you know, almost uh, hourly. Here's an update, here's an update. Make sure you're off at this time. Make sure you know, you've got 30 minutes left to wrap up your work before we go offline. Um, there was also attention to shutting down the legacy system very carefully and very sensitively. Um, we had people asking right up until the week of, or the days leading into the offline weekend, oh, so, um, you know, I can still go in and get my reports from Symphony, right? Or I can still go into Symphony and get my, my patron data, right? Or I can still go and do fill in the blank, right? No, we're sorry. It's actually going away. It's time to say goodbye. <laughs> um, so making sure that folks are aware of that, but then also being, um, being very intentional about access, taking away access at just the right time uh, so that you know, anyone who still thinks, oh, maybe I can still get in, maybe I can have one last, one last search in that legacy system. No, oh, sorry. Um, the pivot to Koha um, at this stage, the goal was for it to go as planned and rehearsed because this is something, again, testing in that middle phase, um, anticipating, kind of rehearsing how the goal line is going to go. And, um, you know, the result is to do that pivot as planned and rehearsed. Then during go live week, offering real time support. So having like an open Zoom room. This is something that, that I think a lot of libraries have done and, and what RCLS opted to do is have an open Zoom room so that people could, from you know, a library could just jump in, drop in, ask a question. Also making sure that phone lines were open, as well as all the usual uh, pathways to ask questions. So the email forms and um, you know, other telephone lines, other Avenues were also still open for asking questions. Something that, um, another piece that's really important in this stage is watching and attending to issues and loss that didn't show up during testing. So that's something that's kind of come out in the last week and a half as we've gotten more questions about reports from libraries after go live and saying, oh, but wait, these, these dates don't look right, or this information didn't look right, or I'm not seeing special characters in certain records, and what's going on here? Um, that's a, making sure that there's space, um, because there may be, there has been additional loss that we weren't fully aware of. Um, during the testing phase that's, that's come up and being sensitive to that. And then also um, in this is a um, staggered uh, rollout of additional new features. So understanding, you know, trying not to overwhelm everyone with a bunch of change and a bunch of new things all at once, taking the essentials in the initial migration and then staging, staggering out the new features um, and new enhancements that are coming with Cohort um, over the weeks and months ahead. 
So some key takeaways from this. And these are, these are color coded according to the, the Bridges transition model, in case you're wondering the, the method behind the madness of the colors. So in that letting go phase, um, giving ample time and attention to working within hierarchical community structures to identify and address places where policies need updating. So this is something um, that I cannot overemphasize enough, especially, I mean, and it really doesn't matter the size of library or library system that you're in. You would be amazed how many policies you've developed that are conditional to how your library system works. We don't intend for our library systems to drive our policies, but it happens because library systems have limitations and some, you know, sometimes they that just impacts how we design our policies. Well, when you're migrating from one system to another system, the um, the those policies don't necessarily have to stay the same. In fact, you are given an opportunity to kind of open up and say, think creatively, well, if I didn't have any limitations at all, what would I really want this policy to be? So, um, so that's, that's freeing, but we also have to acknowledge that the world of policymaking is very political. And so that's why it's really important to work within and collaborate with, with those who are in those hierarchical committee structures in order to affect change in a positive way. And so that's something that I think um, we really attended to uh, very carefully at RCLS. Um, there's a, a multi-tiered committee structure and um, I was working with the system administration, its system administrator, and being present in some of those ILS committee meetings where we would look at library policies as well as how to uh, you know, redesign the documentation for the ILS system and all of the different considerations that we need to be uh, that we need to go into that. So communicating building those bridges and communicating between all of those folks was really helpful. Another key takeaway during that chaos neutral zone space is, was preparing the documentation during testing. So that allowed us, and I, I do want to say we did not start, we did not take all of the symphony documentation and throw it away and start fresh with COBA documentation which I think, you know, might surprise some people because you think, well, why, why, why keep the old, just start new? Um, but we did that intentionally because we knew that folks were very familiar with their symphony documentation. We wanted to make sure that the co-op documentation was going to be in a similar style, format, and layout that they would, it would be familiar to them so that when they're looking for answers, they... They've already got those habits, those, you know, the neural pathways are already set of where they would go to look for that information if they were using Symphony. We wanted to be able to replicate that as best as possible in creating a documentation for that. In the process of doing that, though, we were able to kind of look at the two systems a little bit more closely side by side to see okay, where are the points of commonality? Where are the points of difference? What are the terms that are going to change between Symphony and Koha? Um, you know, and it also um, prompted some creative conversation about changing and adapting workflows. So, you know, there is, you know, like we all know and love about Koha, there's multiple ways to do thing, you know, the same task in co-op. And so which, which one of those ways was going to be the most um, familiar for the RCLS libraries? Oops. 
So another key takeaway was helping staff members overcome their migration fears by providing incentives and encouragement to get involved and stay engaged in during the training. And this one is really super special about our CLS that I had to add an extra slide. So I want to show you how they did this. They used Beanstack. How many of you are familiar with Beanstack platform? Okay, a, a lot of you. So they used Beanstack for their summer reading program challenges. And um, Michelle Muller there at our CLS said, well, hey, we could use Beanstack to create challenges for the training. And so she actually created two different challenges, a first liners migration challenge and then the library staff migration challenge. In these challenges, staff can earn badges. Some of the badges have raffle tickets assigned to them. And those raffle tickets can be entered into gift card giveaways. Each badge had different tasks associated with it that were tied into the migration uh, testing uh, protocol. So each badge offered guidance and opportunities for here's what you can test in Koha. And there were also some badges about that dealt with um, engaging others in migration related exercises. So some of them were um, you know, submitting a ticket or some of them were helping another person with a Koha, uh, with a Koha question. Um, the other really cool thing about using Beanstack is that Michelle and the other staff at our CLS were able to get really robust data to see who was engaged and which libraries they were from. So, you know, because it's part of, this, part of the Beanstack registration process, you put your name in, you put which library you're attached to. So they could see from across the 47 member libraries which libraries, you know, how many staff members in each library were doing the, the challenges, and, um, you know, were there libraries where there were a lot of folks who were active? Were there libraries where there were any folks active? And all of that data could go into helping plan for, and it, well, it did help plan for the migration and the go live weekend and week to be able to anticipate which libraries might need a little more help and hands-on attention than others based on how much, um, how involved they have been in training. Just a little bit of some statistics down here at the bottom. So pre-go live, when I talked to Michelle about a week before go live, they had approximately 300 registered participants out of a 500 FTE. And so that's about 60% of their staff at FTE were registered in Beanstack. And 65% of those registered had completed challenges beyond that initial registration. So that, that is a huge, I know it's not 100%, but it's still a very significant um, amount of folks at our CLS who were engaged and participating in the, in the migration uh, challenges. So I've got three more takeaways. Also in this um, neutral zone space, it was really important to offer and hold space for questions and observations especially when COHA was not meeting expectations. So we did this by um, Alex, the, Alex Carver, the system administrator, set up a uh, form in LibWizard to take people's questions and bug reports. And anytime that form got submitted, it went to, to both Alex and myself, and we would answer those. Um, some days we got a whole bunch, some days we only got one or two, and then there was always a surprise on the weekend, on like a Sunday afternoon, and somebody had been playing with Koha, and I got three emails in a row on Sunday afternoon. Um, but it's holding that space 
giving them that opportunity to say, you know, this isn't what I expected, or I tried this and it didn't quite work, or can you explain to me why, why, why are the permissions set up like this, or why is this, um, why is this acting the way it, it, it is? Uh, was really helpful because it was a, we were able to see. Well, first we were able to give that space to those folks so that they had an immediate way of asking those questions and getting feedback in a timely manner. It was also helpful for us on the ILS side to say to see what people were asking about so that we could understand better what's not clear or maybe what needs additional explanation or additional docu documentation. As part of this process though, um, we would often run across things that were bugs in Koha that had already been reported in Bugzilla. And um, I, I understand this part of, of a migration is, you know, you're not, when you're coming to Koha, you're not just adopting a new integrated library system, right? You're joining a community. You're joining a community that, that gathers together to support and develop and build this software. And so um, when, as part of that migration, as part of that transition period, it's helping the folks who are using Koha understand that you're not just using a piece of software like you've used a piece of software in the past. You're joining a community. You have voice and you have some power to prompt change and development and add enhancement to this, to this software. And so, um, so anytime we ran across a question that was related to a bug, I would provide the link to Bugzilla and say, hey, this is a bug. It's that the community knows about, and it looks like it's going to be in the next release, and you should be able to see it, you know, in another month or two, or it'll be ready by go live. There were a few times people would say, you know, it would really be helpful if Koha did fill in the blank, or I don't, you know, this doesn't seem intuitive. It would be really, you know, much nicer if it looked like this. In those cases, I often found bugs in Bugzilla that were enhancement requests that you know were still new bugs. No one had picked them up yet, or they were in discussion. And um, there was some debate among the developers and the librarians in the community about how to address this. And um, I tell you, it just really excited me because I, I did was able to tell one librarian, I said, hey. This is something that is actively being discussed in the Koha community. Here's the bug link. Feel free to go into Bugzilla and set up an account and add your voice to that conversation. And she did exactly that. So that's a librarian who isn't even live on Koha yet, who is learning how to navigate Bugzilla and engage in the community. So this is Offering this space, holding this space for folks in this transition period can have huge impacts, not just on the library, but on the community as well. So in, in, the, um, in the, the final, um, or the, you know, towards the end, when you get to the new beginnings part, another key takeaway, no matter how much you think you're communicating, communicate some more. Um, this was one place where the process broke down a little bit for our CLS. Um, they thought they were sending out a lot of communications. They thought they were being very clear. They thought they were, you know, providing all the information that folks need. The truth is, and perhaps all of you already know this, but maybe we, we try to deny it sometimes. Everyone does not read everything. <laughs> and so, <laughs> everyone does not read everything. And so, saying it, uh, saying it again, saying it in a different way, um, these are things to attend to. So, um, you know, I don't know, maybe 
um, you know, going back, doing it again, would having um, issued little video updates so that people can watch like a little 60 second video about the migration instead of reading it in an email. Would that have helped? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I don't, you know, a place to put notifications in, you know, various different staff interfaces or um, staff communications that aren't directly related to the migration, but maybe have a little note in there about the migration. Any, any possible way you can try to catch folks, um, try that if next time you're, you're doing something like this. And then again, um, what I already touched on um, before in the timeline, don't forget to recognize those new losses that emerge while celebrating the new beginning. Um, and this, some of this, it kind of goes hand in glove with the communication and communicating more and communicating, um, like over communicating because, um, you know, one of the places, uh, one new, well, had been identified as a loss, but became a new loss for librarians who weren't listening or reading earlier. Um, the cash drawers that RCLS used at several of their libraries, come go live day, those cash drawers didn't open. And this was something that had been communicated, but some people didn't, didn't catch it. And so it became a loss. Oh, you mean, oh, you mean we can't use our cash drawers anymore? Um, so for those on the, on the ILS side, you know, we had already, we had already grieved that. We had already processed that and we had already moved on. But recognizing that, you know, there are going to be those moments for folks who, who weren't with you back there. Now they're experiencing that loss, offering that compassion, Offering that sensitivity can go a long way to, to keeping that migration experience as positive and as healthy as possible. And so now, I would like to open it up for questions. We've got about 15 minutes left, and there's a free answer right here. <laughs> <laughs> There were two questions online, um, and they came up a few minutes ago. Um, so Trevor Diamond says, can you give an example of a feature that you waited to roll out until sometime after the migration? Okay. Um, Communicate again. A feature, a feature, George, where are you? It's back I'm back oh, here. There you are. Okay. <laughs> Um, a feature waited to roll out. Yeah, it's happened. from Trevor Diamond, he, and he asked, can you give an example of a feature that you waited to roll out until sometime after the initial migration? So the acquisitions model module is going to be something that's rolled out a little later. Um, acquisitions is not something that was used in Symphony. And so um, the acquisitions, there are a couple of libraries who were, who were doing some live testing of acquisitions kind of on their own, um, but there will be more training and uh, you know, documentation and all of that for the, um, for the acquisitions module. Okay. I've, I've also put in a plug for exploring the use of the ILL module because um, the way RCLS currently does their ILL requesting, um, I think the ILL module, particularly some of the new um, enhancements of bringing the freeform back end into um, the latest build of COHA, um, can be really helpful. So that's going to be something that we we do. Okay, and then SFPL is wondering, can we get an example of a policy that was determined by the ILS? So um, the one that comes to my mind uh, first is the, the policy for how long bills would stay on a patron's account. 
Uh, so there had been a, a previous policy with Symphony that talked about how long um, paid bills would stay on and how long unpaid bills would stay on. COHA cannot um, differentiate between paid and unpaid bills. The, the cron job that, that COHA uses to clear out old bills just clears out old bills. Um, so that was a piece um, where they had to kind of come together and compromise on the length of time for both paid and unpaid bills to stay on patron accounts. Okay, thank you. That was uh, from Trevor Dime and then from SFB also. I also I would want to welcome, so Michelle and Megan are on Zoom. They are both at RCLS. They have the video off. If y'all want to turn your video on uh, and wave and say hello to people. Oh boy. Okay. I'm Alex Carver. I'm the software analyst and administrator at the Ramapo Catskill Library System, and we are live on Koha as of last week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm Megan Doyle. I'm the community and digital equity consultant. Uh, so I'm more of a people person. So I was one of our liaisons to the staff throughout the, the whole process. And my name is Michelle Muller and I am the member and youth services consultant here at RCLS as of February. So I stepped into here <laughs> kind of in that little uncomfortable zone. Um, so I was really excited to be part of the process from both kind of the on the ground side in the library and then coming over to the administrative side. We had a lot of rookies in the process. I mean, I hadn't even been uh, a system admin for, for two years yet. Um, so I think we did pretty good, Michelle. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Okay, I see a question back here. I'm sorry. I hope the coach. Um, I, I just really quickly, I'm wondering about um, development. Like, were there any situate? Like, do you have any new developments as part of this migration? And are there any that? You, you would like to see, like, you know, because part of it is, well, this is how it's working now. Um, but in the future, we would really like to see this as a development. Uh, so there were there were really no major developments that we needed for our, our functionality. Um, I, I'm sorry, I missed uh, the most of the presentation, but I'm sure Micah talked about the consensus seeking and, and we explained early what, what would not be possible and what would be possible in Koha. Um, I would like to see some developments to the circulation map. I am feeling some, uh, I'm feeling the absence of some features we had with our with our old vendor, mostly with having like a separate holds map um, that we can configure apart from the circulation map. Um, I've used the the cost transport matrix currently to, to set some of those up um, and that's working well, but having its own uh, place to live would be great. But mostly, um, we're using vanilla and it's working. Hi, I'm, oh, hi. I'm wondering if um, you had this transition model in mind while you were working this through, or was it something that, you, um, that helped you process it afterward, even though afterward is, you know, five days, um, four, 10 days. Um, and also what did the, the folks who are joining us remotely, what did they think, how accurately do you think that this trans transition model reflects your experience? So I'll start first. Um, the transition model is something that I brought to, to this process. Um, as their consultant, um, I pretty much did and supported them in whatever way they needed me to. And so um, you know, they already had a really strong handle on how they wanted this process to go. And so um, I, I was looking at that transition model and how I use that in my own coaching and consulting. I was really impressed with how closely their process had already aligned with that transition model. So, um, so yeah, so that's, I, I, I don't know if 
if um, Grace Rario, the, the CEO of RCLS, if she had that in mind as she was kind of thinking about how the transition would go. Um, but it's it certainly comes across to me as a really great example of how to use that bridges transition model uh, to understand the different movements that happen you know, during the migration process. And then I guess the second half of the question can go to you all. Yeah, I, I would just add, we, we did have kind of a rough outline of how this process would go. We put together a timeline and shared it with our ILS committee, which is made up of, of member library directors. But that is not to say we didn't have, um, I don't want to call them emergency meetings, but maybe quickly scheduled meetings. We're like, okay, we, we're running into this speed bump. How can we fix this? Um, like the, the RCLS liaison idea, like we didn't know this back in December or January. That came out of a meeting is how can we best support our member libraries? We started anticipating the the volume of questions and calls that would come in and knowing that that I couldn't handle it, that my department couldn't handle it all alone, right? We, we are we are staffed for our normal jobs and we still had to do those. And now we had a migration on top of it. So so we did poach from other departments. Um, and luckily our executive director, Grace, she was completely on board with that. Luckily, Megan and Michelle said, yes, we will help with this. We would have been in trouble otherwise. Any other questions? Question over here. Uh, Philip Berg online is asking if a prospective Bywater customer doing due diligence wanted to ask questions of RCLS, uh, who would they contact? Could we get an email up on the screen or something? Yes, I have email addresses on the last slide. Okay, so. Hopefully that'll answer Phil's question, Phil's question. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, so definitely email me. Just maybe wait a week before pulling the trigger on that email. <laughs> <laughs> I I'd like to add that that was something that we were very conscious of as a staff in general, of insulating Alex from the hordes of but what about this? But what about that? This is different. I don't like it. All of the different kinds of comments and questions that we could be getting. Um, we needed him to be able to focus on the technical stuff to make the actual technical migration go smoothly. And so this liaison system that we created, we had three of us and we divided up the 47 libraries in by the three uh, consultants. And we each had our our set that we were responsible for and we communicated with them that you are to contact me and me alone if you have questions and I will go to the right person if it, if I don't know the answer I will find out for you but under no circumstances are you to call or email Alex directly um, because we wanted him to be able to focus and I, I and everybody bought in they were totally on board with this liaison system and they said okay that works for us and they liked having a contact person because I'm still getting emails from people I hope it's okay that I still email you I still have a question and and that's fine because that means Alex is still able to keep going on you know the the tweaking that's happening still um, and, and that really did work very well for our setup. I wanted to give a little shout out to the education educator team and such at Bywater also, because when we, we were a smaller library, we still are a smaller library. But the change for us was very smooth, I think, um, considering basically we could make a phone call, we could do an email back and forth, we could chat, we could Zoom, whatever the case may be, we could get the answer right away. Um, and their support to us was invaluable. It wasn't, it took a lot of pressure off of us in the, on, on the front line um, because we had a go-to that knew exactly what we were talking about and could work us, work us through it. I'll, I'll echo those sentiments. Absolutely. Um, I would say that before January of this year, I was, the word would be terrified of this project. Um, and then after that first meeting with, with the educators, that just moved down to scared, which is where it stayed. <laughs> <laughs> but they are terrific. Yeah. 
I just have a comment, um, not a question, but as someone who in a library has been a systems librarian overseeing this transition and now in a migration librarian with Biowater, so I see it from the other side. I think your use of the Beanstalk to get your staff engaged and trained, that is brilliant. I love it. I just, I just had to say that is so awesome. It's Katrina. Um, <laughs> I wanted to see Michelle on that note regarding the Beanstalk um, templates. Have you been able to talk and see if that's something that we can make available to other migrating libraries? I did speak to um, my representative at Beanstalk, and she did say that it is possible. Um, she would have to bring it up a level from her, um, and it would have to be uh, requested by the library um, in order to, and then, you know, communicated to us and then us allowing. So um, there's, there is, it's in the works um, as far as being included in their templates. Typically, they have their templates and their templates alone. Um, it's not other libraries or other systems developing templates for them, um, but it is something that she was taking up a level to communicate and see where it goes from there. So I will certainly keep Bywater in, involved and um, letting them know if we make any success or progress with that. Is there, is there time for two, for two more comments, Bob? We're, okay. Uh, so there's, well, actually, one of these is a question. Um, so Tillamook County Library says, besides email, did you have any one area people could go to review communications? So I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. Um, Maybe the LibGuide, Megan? Yeah, I'm having a hard time understanding the question. Um, are, you're looking for information about what we did? I don't know because it's a communication coming in on the YouTube feed. Are our LibGuides public? Yeah. Yeah. Or, uh, we have, we created a LibGuide for, uh, we created a LibGuide for our uh, member libraries to be able to keep up with what we're doing and to communicate. Here's what you have to do. Here's why you have to do it. Here's when you have to do it. Um, all of that kind of stuff. And we just kept adding to it through the process. So um, we can share a link to that. I don't know if I put it. If there's a chat here, I could put it here, and then I don't know if that could be put on the screen or something. If, but uh, I can Mike find it and share it. Email address on the last slide, then, then these people should be able to contact Mike, and then they, they can get the link all worked out. And Tillamook County Library is saying, perfect, thank you. If there's a little guy, that's awesome. Uh, and then the other comment is um, from WPPL. We did the same thing for our migrational aid liaison per, depart per department. They triaged and communicated with appropriate people. And our sysadmin sys was off limits for direct questions or issues. And I think there are some other comments coming through. And I'm going to let Bob have the microphone back because I think we're past time. So. Yeah, I think we are. I'm going to go ahead and um, y'all want to wave. Um, <laughs> before I switch off the slide, or put the slide back up on the screen. Um, so, okay, and then I'm going to move my. Yeah, we're good. Okay, okay, there we go. So, this is the thank you slide. Um, you've got both. Um, my information as well as Alice's information at RCLS. Um, we're happy to hear from you, answer any other questions, um, and share more about this migration experience. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>